Testing, testing. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Future of AI Forum, hosted by Senator Cantwell. Um, please take your seats now as we're getting ready to start the panel discussion. Good morning. I'm going to get started while you're taking your seats because we don't have a lot of time together. So welcome. Thank you all for joining today. My name is Nicole DiCario, and I am with the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence, where I lead our work on AI and society. Today we look forward to the Future of AI Forum, where we'll have a robust and informative discussion about the current state of AI, the future state of AI, and its societal impacts. As I said, we don't have a lot of time together, so we're just going to jump right in. It's my pleasure to introduce our host, Senator Cantwell, for opening remarks. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for helping us, Nicole, be uh, a great panel discussion and for the Allen Institute leadership. I want to thank uh, Dr. Ocasio for coming to the Pacific Northwest and her leadership at, the, uh, at NIST and for her leadership that we're going to hear tomorrow about on chips and science. So thank you so much. But welcome to the AI Forum. 
We're here because artificial intelligence and things like quantum computing are game changers. They have the potential to help us solve pressing global challenges like climate change, hunger, poverty, disease, and are pivotal to our competitiveness for the future. Like all technologies, AI brings lots of opportunities. There are some risks, but we need to realize that emerging technologies like AI and quantum are things that we must harness and make them work for us as a nation. That both our national security and competitiveness as a nation means that we need to be leaders in AI. And today we have some exciting technology that everyone gets to see when it comes to that leadership. We do need to ensure that government keeps pace with AI, and that is very important from the messaging and the uh, leadership that was provided in 2017. We introduced, I, with my colleague, Senator Young from Indiana, legislation to say, what should the government strategy on AI be? We passed that legislation in 2020 and convened academia and experts to discuss what the role should be for the government sector in coordination with the private sector. So I'm very happy that that National Advisory Committee of Experts, we have some representatives here today on the panel that will discuss their work on that committee and what the United States government should be doing. One of the priorities you're going to hear about was to provide more AI resources for academia and for small businesses. A second was to make sure that we were coming up with an international risk management strategy and certainly to think about the impacts on workforce. So two members of this committee, Ashley Lawrence from Microsoft Research and Swami Shivasubramayan. Is that close? Is that like maybe like a tenth <laughs> from Amazon Web Services? Both members of that national task force are here so they can talk about their work over the last several years in positioning us as a country on AI. I believe the government must continue to partner with industry and academia and that that public-private partnership is the right direction for us to keep going. One important partnership that has been driving that innovation, though, is the Allen Institute for AI. And so we're so proud that they have been making incredible advancements in science, medicine, and conservation through AI, and that the Allen Institute for AI was the birthplace of the AI2 incubator. This incubator funds startups and early stage companies, and we can see many of them are here today. So excited to see the AI applications in areas which I would just call precision agriculture. I know the WSU is here, and to see some of their robotics, but uh, other companies like Laser Weeder that we just saw over here, amazing <laughs> technology. When you think about all the AI, what I would just say AI applications in precision agriculture are just ways to drive efficiency and competitiveness for U.S. growers. This is critically important in a changing climate environment where agriculture has become more challenging and something as important as water AI can help our farmers know exactly how much water to use on every single acre. So it's very exciting to see the successes of those companies. The healthcare applications that we've seen today are something as basic as metro, uh, metrolia, is that right? Is that what I'm saying, metrolia, right? Their technology just trying to help make uh, our traffic systems more efficient and reduce traffic fatalities and help local governments who are already shorthanded plan the right investments and move forward on them. Uh, there are many, many more applications here today, and that is what is exciting about the whole advent of where we're going in AI. We do have to figure out a few guardrails, and I'm sure we'll talk about that today, um, but I don't want the guardrails to limit the focus because I want the focus to be on how do we continue that public-private partnership 
to encourage more AI. But certainly, uh, tomorrow I will be speaking to the Defense, the Defense Advanced Research Project the agency, DARPA, and they will be talking about how to make sure that we don't have deep fakes and how we stop foreign adversaries for, from intentionally corrupting data sets and acquiring U.S. data that we don't want them to have. And I'm sure that we will be talking about how AI can be used in discriminatory ways that we don't want to be allowed that would prevent somebody from getting a job or a loan or uh, potentially making them more targeted for other uh, negative activities. And that's why I've introduced privacy legislation that would protect people from that kind of discriminatory practices. And I hope that we will get that legislation done. And we also need to make sure that uh, we're thinking about how any kind of emergency, emerging technology increases the transformation in training and education sectors. We need to have the workers better understand how they can use AI for their advantage in the workplace but also how we need to think more constructively about how our government works on these issues. I always like to think about World War II, where the women had to go in the factories and keep U.S. production. That was a big transformation. Or the transformation when the guys came home from World War II and everybody said, what's the economy of the future going to be? And we gave them the GI Bill, and they created it. So now, instead of a GI Bill, we need an AI education bill. We need a bill that says, how do we educate for the future, given the impacts of AI? How do we offer the training and the skill set so people can adapt now in their workplace? And how can we get the Department of Commerce and the Department of Labor to work together to transform the skill level of the workforce that we need for the information age and AI revolution that's going to happen? So I don't think Americans have ever shied away from innovation, and we shouldn't today. So let's embrace the opportunities before us, and let's talk about what we need to do to make America critically successful in this technology and maintain our leadership. Thank you so much, Nicole, again, for being the MC of this great discussion. My pleasure. Um, Dr. Lukoskio, you have some remarks as well. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. I really appreciate that. And Senator Cantwell, it's such a pleasure to be here with you in Washington State. Um, it's, it's, you know, I really enjoyed the showcase, walking around, seeing what everybody is doing, and seeing the impact of the work that you're doing in the AI space has been incredible. So what a great opportunity um, to really look around. And I just wanted to mention that today, uh, NIST announced a grant to the University of Washington for human AI bias interaction. So that just was announced this morning. Yeah. Um, so, uh, likewise, w watching all this innovation happen, likewise at NIST, we are working on advancing innovation in AI and also advancing trustworthy approaches to AI that serve all people in responsible and equitable and beneficial ways. Um, we are a federal laboratory whose mission is really focused on economic security for this country and focused on um, advancing innovation in the country. And we've been that way since 1901. In 1901, we were working in the second, in the technological revolution or the second uh, industrial revolution. So the problems were a little bit different. But now, you know, working in uh, advancing trustworthiness of, of all technologies as they develop in, in light of the digital revolution that's been going on for quite a while now. So our work um, is a broad portfolio of research, but we have a long-standing reputation of building trust in technology, whatever that technology is. And so we develop standards and measurement science that make technology more secure and usable and robust and reliable, and in other words, more trustworthy. And this, of course, is critical in AI space where we really do need to engender public trust as we're doing all of these great innovations. So as was mentioned, of course, AI technologies have this potential to revolutionize and transform society and people's lives from commerce and health, things that we saw today, uh, transportation, cybersecurity, and environment, climate. Um, AI technologies can 
drive and do drive inclusive economic growth and support scientific achievements that change the conditions of the entire world. Um, but as was mentioned, they do pose risks. So we have to be aware of those risks, and we have to know how to manage those risks to, uh, to organizations and individuals and society. And that's a lot of what the work that NIST is doing is, is about, to manage those risks. Um, so the recent releases, of course, of the large language models point to the actuality that AI technologies are advancing much faster than standards and benchmarks and policy and governance and accountability measure uh, mechanisms necessary to, to make sure we do have that public trust. But the US economy, our national security, and really the fabric of our society depends on us finding reasonable solutions, reasonable and practical solutions surrounding generative AI and related technologies. And specifically, there is an urgent need for developing and using solutions that will result in more trustworthy AI. And that's really where I started, building trust in the technology. Um, trust not in uh, related to the technical solutions or the in the technical sense, but also in the socio-technical sense because you can't separate the AI system from the human it's interacting with. And uh, you know, some have really posed that this is an easy problem, building trust in AI. Um, but, but a lot of people realize we need a long-term solution. We need to really work closely in partnership with, with the community. It has to be a community-driven approach, deeply integrated throughout our R&D and our applications ecosystem across the entire field and the application space for AI. And so, NIST is working in that space. As a matter of fact, out of the 2020 AI Act that was mentioned, NIST was called on to build an AI risk management framework, and some of you are familiar with that. Um, in our work, we incorporate stakeholders in every part of that process. And part of that is so that we come up with reliable and practical measurement and standards-oriented solutions that um, already have stakeholder buy-in, so that when we, we release these reports and these guidances, uh, people are already engaged, and they're already bought in, and that means more effective outcomes. And so, if I can just mention, there are follow-ons to the NIST, IA, the NIST AI uh, risk management framework that we're working on right now. I'll just mention a few of these. One, very recently, um, we created a generative AI public working group that includes users and managers and developers and employers of generative AI systems. Um, and we also coordinate with government agencies. And we are convening this for the purposes of, of, of including, uh, of, of developing guidance and industry norms for verification of generative AI models pre-release. Um, we're also developing with this group, with this public working group, guidance for how to secure models and, uh, and, and guidance for how to understand the provenance of AI-generated content. Um, also, NIST is following the NIST AI uh, risk management framework with a lot of work on how to measure the trustworthiness of your system. And so we are in the process of building a foundation for testing and evaluation and verification and validation of AI models. Um, and we're doing that not only with internal research, but also working with you, working with everybody in the community to make sure we have this right. And then finally, NIST is strengthening its efforts in standards, international standards related to AI specifically. Um, and, and that is really consistent with the US government's recent release of a national standard strategy for critical and emerging technologies that NIST has been asked to lead for the country. Um, so I'll stop there and say I'm just really feeling fortunate to be here, be, be with you, Senator, and I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to now um, have the panelists introduce themselves. We have one panelist who's joining us remotely. That's Ryan Kahlo. We'll get started around the table, Ryan, and we'll kick it to you at the end. So, Manoj. <clears throat> Thank you, Nicole. And my name is Manus Karki, as you can see here, a professor at Washington State University Center for Precision and Automated Agricultural Systems. 
Um, I grew up in the eastern hills of Nepal, some 400 kilometers from Kathmandu, some 40, 45 years ago, as you can see now. Uh, doing subsistence farming, we used to be growing pretty much everything we needed, chicken, goat, uh, all kinds of crops, uh, and uh, again, uh, a lot of different kinds of things. And I used to work in these farms every like morning and evening before I go to school or come back from school. Now then I moved to Kathmandu for my undergrad in computer science and then to Thailand for my master's in remote sensing and GIS and Iowa State University for my PhD in agricultural engineering, kind of connecting the dots back to, to what I used to do growing up uh, versus I, what I started doing as a PhD student. Um, that's where I was starting to, to learn about automation and robotics and and uh, AI tools, how it could be used for uh, solving various agricultural challenges um, that we'll be talking about briefly uh, uh, today here as well. And then after completing my PhD, I joined Washington State University in 2010 and have been working in this area of uh, AI and robotics for agriculture, uh, where we would like to again use some of these really advanced technologies, tools, models to solve day-to-day -day challenges our farmers are facing uh, in terms of improving yield and quality, but also uh, keeping our farms sustainable economically, socially, and environmentally for, for long. And with that, I think I'll stop there and, and uh, let you continue. As a fellow Buckeye, I want to say go Bucks. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, Senator Cantwell, for the opportunity to join this panel today and to the fellow panelists. I'm excited uh, for this conversation. My name is Sharika Carter. I use she, her pronouns, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Secretary Treasurer of the Washington State Labor Council, AFL-CIO. The WSOC is the largest labor organization in the state. We are the voice of working people, representing half a million working people and over 600 local labor unions and councils across the state. Together, President April Sims and myself are the first state federation of the AFL-CIO to be led by two black people. And while I can say it speaks to April and my leadership, it is a testament to the commitment of Washington's labor movement to equity and join the work to build a labor movement where all working people wanted to join. Washington State proudly boasts the third highest union density in the country at 20%, uh, twice the national average, and working people are organizing and joining every day together in union on the job. And so as we think about today's conversation, I want to lift this up, that the people closest to the problem are closest to the solutions. We have the answers within us. And so working people must be a part of this conversation around AI, we must have a seat at the table. And Washington is continually one of the best states for both workers and business, um, which speaks to our work partnering with business to ensure working people receive a fair return on our work. And in AI and the impact uh, on work is a continued opportunity to partner. So I'm confident that labor, business, and along with government can figure out the future of work together. Working people must be at the center of the conversation and all the issues of the future of work. And because we know that the labor movement has the skills, the knowledge to help labor reach the next frontier. And so we're growing and deploying our bargaining power in these conversations and discussions and are committed to making sure that the benefits of technology can create prosperity and security for everyone, not just the wealthy and powerful. And so I'm happy to join today's conversation and center working families and how AI can be used to make our lives better, our work safer, and our community stronger. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, I'm Ali Farhari. I'm the CEO of the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Um, I'm also a professor at the University of Washington. Uh, my area of focus has been for the last couple of decades on, on AI, computer vision and inter inter intersection in computer vision and natural language processing and tiny bit of robotics. Um, at the Allen Institute for AI, we are uh, focused on fundamental research in AI and would like to see the impact of our research on few important problem areas like conser conservation. We work on natural language processing, we work on computer vision, 
and an embodiment. Um, and some of the key questions that we're going to talk about today are going to be uh, some of the key topics that we we'll spend a fair amount of time at. Um, uh, one of the key main missions that we have is AI for the common good. And these days we argue that for AI for the common good, there is one key element necessary for that, and that's the openness uh, of the approach, the data, the models, the whole stack. Uh, and the impact it has, not only on the technology, but also on, on ethical aspects, on legal aspects of the subject. Excited to be on a panel with all of these amazing folks and looking forward to our conversations. Thank you. Hello, um, Ashley Lorenz uh, with Microsoft Research. Uh, let me just first say uh, it's an honor to, be on, honor to be on the panel. And Senator Cantwell, Dr. Locasio, thank you for your great leadership. Um, I am a distinguished scientist and managing director at Microsoft Research. Uh, Microsoft Research is a part of Microsoft. We do fundamental and applied research. Um, we connect the uh, Microsoft Research, the labs around the world, to the rest of the company and the rest of the research ecosystem. So we also uh, you know, connect with academia, uh, UW, Allen Institute, and many of uh, the fine uh, organizations represented here. So um, one of the programs that we're, you know, I'm excited to talk more about is our Accelerate Foundation Models Research Program uh, that actually makes the foundation models uh, from Microsoft and OpenAI available to academic uh, institutions and nonprofit. Uh, and it's always great to put new tools in people's hands and really see, uh, see the innovation at work. My own background is in machine learning, uh, AI, robotics. Um, like you know, several of us, I've been doing machine learning since before it was cool, uh, about 20 years ago. Um, I'm also a member of the National AI Advisory Committee along with my colleague Swami. Uh, last year, as you alluded to, actually, we made some recommendations, for example, in support of the National AI Research Resource, which I think will be a really important uh, cross-sector initiative. Um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to, uh, Congress will be able to fund that, uh, fund that fully. So uh, really uh, an honor to be on the panel. Looking forward to, uh, to the conversation. Well, uh, my name is Swami. Uh, you don't have to remember my last name. Uh, um, I, uh, I'm a vice president in charge of uh, data and AI at AWS, uh, the Amazon cloud computing uh, division. First of all, again, uh, thanks again, Senator, uh, for having me on the panel. It's an honor to be here. And uh, thanks, Dr. Lopasi, also. Uh, I'll just a uh, brief introduction about myself. So I came to Seattle and uh, to join Amazon as an intern 17 years ago uh, to kickstart uh, an uh, exploratory effort uh, called Amazon Web Services. For folks who don't know what that is, that is AWS, uh, which came out to be cloud computing. So, uh, so my internship project, I guess, turned out to be successful. So, so they gave me a job back and, uh, and then started building different parts of uh, Amazon Cloud. Uh, um, as an engineer and uh, various other things. But the premise behind cloud computing uh, that gone are the days where people used to wait for resources to be available to come up with the next big idea. Instead, you can actually get in an instant through an API call. It was like game changing. And we live in such a moment again right now with AI. Like, uh, what we used to do before that would take like six months can be possible now within a matter of one to two weeks. And that is one of the most exciting things that is happening. And that is kind of uh, what my team does in AWS, uh, which is all around AI and data. So how do you actually enable millions of developers who use AWS to be able to innovate faster with uh, AI and data? not just in a uh, quick and high performance way, but in a secure and responsible way as well. And uh, uh, in Amazon, we tend to use the phrase, it's day one in the age of internet. Uh, but in this phase, I would say it's uh, day one, we just woke up and we haven't even had a cup of coffee yet. So <laughs> it is really that exciting in terms of innovation. But. Uh, but we won't get there and realize the potential unless we embrace it fully. So that's why we have invested a lot in this space in terms of uh, not just a bunch of capabilities and services, but like uh, enabling in terms of innovation courses that are available through Coursera to Innovation Center to help startups and organizations and whatnot. But uh, 
looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Ryan, go ahead. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Kilo, and I'm a law professor in information science at the University of Washington. Um, I'm so sorry I couldn't be there in person, uh, but I really appreciate your example of doing this as a model of um, Just a little bit like the way you talk about the question of smoke or something else, but I can give me on the next screen. Um, so I also want to say, uh, Ryan, Ryan, we're having a little bit of problem hearing you. If there's any way to increase the volume or bring the microphone closer to you. Yeah, yeah sounds, sounds good. good. Hold on a Thank you. It's better. Senator, can you hear me now? Yes. I'm a little, I'm a little bit worried, worried about the wizard that I might have uh, uh, <laughs> booming in the room. But, okay. Um, so I'm a law professor and information scientist um, at the University of Washington. Um, my position is relatively simple. The idea is that if AI really changes everything, then one of the things that needs to change is law and legal institutions. It's not as though the government in the turn of the century said, hey, if you're going to light your house with uh, something other than fire or talk to people miles away using waves, um, you can just use existing laws to address the harms and risks that may come up. Uh, indeed, they have entirely new laws and created entirely new regulatory structures and institutions. Now, AI is not a thing like a light bulb or even an electrical grid. Um, it's a set of techniques aimed at approximating some aspect of human or animal cognition using machines. But that doesn't mean that laws, if new laws shouldn't be passed. And I can think of at least two kinds. The first are the kind that improve the policy landscape overall. For example, by removing barriers to accountability and shoring up deficits in government expertise. One example of that that's already occurring is, of course, the NIST framework that we've heard about already. Um, but another would be revitalizing and resuscitating the Office of Technology Assessment, an agency that for years helped Congress make wiser decisions about technology, but was defunded in the 90s. Um, another set of, of ideas involve um, uh, shoring up specific gaps uh, that AI creates. For example, Senator Cantwell alluded to privacy, changing privacy laws to adapt to the affordances of artificial intelligence, but other areas such as security, labor, copyright, even the practice of law itself need to be updated. So uh, again, the basic position is just AI, I agree, it changes everything, but it would be very strange if one of the things didn't change were law and legal institutions. And so I look forward to getting more specific about how we can do that and want to thank Senator Cantwell both for hosting us today and also for her longstanding leadership in the area of law and technology in Washington and across the country. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Ryan. All right, we finally get to get started with some questions. Um, as we, we're here today for the Future of AI Forum because coverage of AI has just exploded over the past year. Um, so we'll start with just a quick question, and Swami, I'll direct this one to you to begin. Um, talk a little bit about what excites you the most about AI in this moment and where we're headed. Um, generative AI especially uh, has captured all our imaginations because they can not only write stories and haikus, they can create images and videos. Uh, but that's not what is exciting. To me, what is exciting about uh, AI is also, it provides a great opportunity to actually make many of these areas uh, better in terms of customer experience, better in terms of uh, productivity of uh, jobs to do, let alone actually enabling net new possibilities. I'll just give one example to kind of make the point. One of the customers I worked with, uh, Autodesk, they use generative AI on AWS. and. Uh, to spin up new designs, and one such design was for like in uh, designing an uh, aircraft part. And uh, while doing it, uh, one of the generative AI-based design actually became uh, pro produced a component that was 45 percent more fuel efficient, more than actually what a human could do. And the impact of such a thing is something to the effect of like taking 92,000 cars off the road on a yearly basis think about the art of possible. That is just one company in one industry. Now, if you do such a thing in, uh, across every such industry, so 
in terms of innovation. But of course, uh, such innovation, we are in such early days in this space, uh, it's like 1995 and the internet just broke out and so much is left to do. And one of the key challenges, uh, that is what excites me because all of us need a challenge to actually keep us going in terms of innovation is generative AI especially is not accessible to everyone and uh, because uh, these uh, and to make it accessible, we need uh, actually these technologies to be easily accessible to all developers and uh, not just a few labs and companies, but also actually how to take these education, some of the coursework that uh, you talked about, uh, so that everyone is prepared for a world where that is required to be known as much as we use like a word processor or a spreadsheet. Uh, and uh, then how do you reimagine the entire uh, set of how do we do things and so forth. And of course, finally, in such a world, these technologies do need to be deployed in a safe manner. So some of the effort that we talked about as part of NIAC and actually how we do in AWS with NIST uh, framework around risk management framework. How do you actually interview that as part of the development process as well is some of the things uh, that actually is very challenging, but also exciting in terms of getting to developers. Thank you. Speaking of accessibility, it leads me to think about openness. So, Ali, you're working on a generative language model that is open. Can you talk a little bit about what that means and why it's important? Absolutely. I think building upon Swami's point about accessibility to a broader range of practitioners in this space, um, we at AI2, we are strong believers in extreme openness when it gets to AI. And I would like to use my minutes here to argue why that extreme openness is going to be a crucial element in, in AI progress. Um, first of all, historically looking back at how did we get to here when all excitement about AI is actually all over the place. If you trace it back, it was step by step incremental progress. People put it out there, build, people build upon those, and then one after, step after the other took us to where we are today. It's astonishing these technologies are extremely powerful. Um, most of us, if you would have asked us five years ago, are we going to be here today, we would have said probably not. Uh, but we're here, it's a lot of excitement. But openness played a key role in the progress of this whole, this whole wave. Um, but aside from, uh, from, from the progress, um, I think thinking about the next steps now that we have such a powerful technology in our hands, I think as Senator Campbell mentioned, it's on us to make sure that we, the models that we have are safer, the technologies that we develop are reliable, are trustworthy, and the fact that we could use them in specific ways. And I would like to argue that openness would empower all of those. By moving from, um, and I'm going to borrow a terminology from a friend, from a black box models that we practice in many places, to a glass box. We would like to see all aspects of these models. And if you look at the industry, there are some efforts along this direction. Uh, we've seen some people putting part of the system out there. Some are a little concerned about legal aspects. Uh, but we would argue that we would like to open up the whole process. We would like to open up from the very early stages of AI development, specifically, as Swami mentioned, generative AIs these days. It starts from data, a data pipeline that converts your data to things that a model can consume, the model training phase, then the model itself. And now these days we see some models out there with, and then the inference stack on top of that. Um, and we're taking steps at a time just this Friday, we released the first three trillion tokens of data open to the public. This is the data that's going to be used for, for, uh, for training of these models. Uh, that's the very first instance of a dis these kind of data that at scale. Um, it, it ta we're taking some risk here because of the scale of the data and the openness approach that we take. We, we tried our best to put a license there that's most amenable to major players in this space with the emphasis that we actually do want commercial use of these kind of, uh, of, of data points. Um, and I would argue that for the openness doesn't stop there. We need to make sure that we can reproduce some of these models. We need to make sure that we have all the steps, step by steps that people have taken uh, to get to that point. Um, the other element that I would like to doubly emphasize is how expensive 
these learnings are for these ginormous models that are the winning models these days. These models are big. My friends who are practicing these could actually sort of tell us how, how expensive those models are. But my argument is that it's not expensive just for the cost, but also very expensive for the environment. And the open approach to this problem would allow us to learn from other people's learning, so we don't redo those. If I have developed something and I've used it and I train a model and I've developed a set of learnings along the way, those learnings belong to everybody. And we would argue that we would like to open up that approach so everybody can benefit from it, so someone else doesn't need to redo the experiment that I ran. Those experiments are, are expensive, both commercial, economically and environmentally, and I would argue that an open approach would also give us a win over there. Thank you. Can I yeah. ask a question about that? Because listen, I definitely think as someone who's fought for an open internet in general, and very important on things like net neutrality and, and to you know keep costs down. What, what's the long-term model? Right now you're saying what we're doing is publishing our research. So Dr. Lacaziano just had this other experience where we were trying to get everybody to think about the fact that our universities really have been rewarded for publishing, but in the information age, everybody was using our publishings and implementing them in their countries. And so we were like, hey, chips and science has got to be a little bit more about patenting and then translating the science faster. So what is your long-term vision for how openness would work in, this, in, in the AI case? Um, excellent question. So um, I think we need to rethink about what, it, what does it actually mean for me to put a research, piece of research out there for multiple different reasons. One being, um, let me move my marketing here so I can look at you when I talk. <laughs> so w one, being, uh, one being that just putting a paper out there is not enough anymore. I would argue we're putting systems out there, putting models and data out there. And the cost of arriving at those are prohibitive at the moment. So one of the initiatives that I would like to see from, from, from the government perspective is how can we empower these kind of open approaches to the problem, knowing that the, med, the biggest bottleneck right now is the compute that you need to get that data, to clean that data, to train a model using that data, and then putting it out there. And my personal opinion uh, is, Putting out there these days means put a working system out there. But that working system, I would like to, to be extremely open. Anybody should be able to reproduce it. People should be able to see what data comes uh, to, to train this model. And I would like to gently... Even, even our adversaries. Um, yes, I would argue that this would actually help us build a safer environment. So uh, these technologies are extremely powerful. We would not be able to, to confine them anymore. It's already out there. Now that it's out there, we have two strategies. Let have a small number of players, including the adversaries, because adversaries are going to be players regardless, or we'll open it up so we actually have a lot more momentum on the positive side. And looking back at the history of how software have been development have been actually progress, same. whenever we actually opened up a yeah, piece of technology, same. the same. progress outper, outpaced the malicious acts. Um, I would also like to touch upon a small piece of legal issues here, because these models are black box. No one knows what contributed to these models. I, I like your black box, glass box analogy. Yeah. It's good. Um, and I would argue the minute that we establish traceability from these models to the training data that was used for these models, our legal framework, our IP framework, all of them would be in much better shape because the traceability is established. And that's another key element that why I argue for an extreme open approach to, to, to AI, knowing that we're putting a, a malicious technology out there, but it's already out there. All of this openness and accessibility also leads to deep, deep innovation. So I want to move a little bit and talk about innovation and what that means. We saw in the showcase today that Washington State is behind some really unique and innovative approaches to applying AI. So um, Manoj, I'll let you start with this one. Can you talk a little bit about taking AI and applying it for good and what that means to you? Well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, our panelists here presented <coughs> their work in uh, fundamental algorithm and <coughs> model development. I'm sorry, give me a second. Uh, thank you. Uh, they've been doing that, that kind of work for decades, and here we stand with really powerful models. And our role as uh, applied researchers in agriculture is to bring these 
innovative, powerful models into solving day-to-day uh, -day problems that our farming communities are, are facing. So going back, using <clears throat> various kinds of AI models, we developed decision support systems that would help our farmers make various decisions more consistently, more reliably, more robustly, so that they can uh, apply as little of the input as possible to produce as much good quality produces as possible. For example, we have been developing these models to help farmers make good decisions in terms of amount, location, and type of input that needs to be applied to, to control certain paste. Or for example, to apply right amount of water at right time, at right location, so that we can preserve this really precise resource while also producing as, as much and maybe even higher amount of uh, crops uh, with using these models. In addition to that, the advancement in AI, for example, some of these deep learning uh, models that are used to process images have helped automate some of these farming operations in the recent years. For example, I've been working in developing automated um, apple picking machine for quite some time, but we're using some conventional methods that would be <clears throat> impacted by changing um, lighting conditions, like there will be sometimes cloud, you would need to operate in the nighttime as well to maximize the uh, productivity of these machines. Those were the issues we're not able to handle as robustly until these what we call convolutional neural networks were, were developed and and along with that, there came the parallel computing that allowed us to process these models within a couple of milliseconds so that it can become real-time decision in the field. So my robot can now operate in the daytime, nighttime, under cloudy condition, rainy condition, and can perform these very computationally heavy tasks to find where the apples are, where branches are, where other uh, canopy or, or tree uh, objects are very uh, precisely, accurately, within, again, the real-time limit so that this robot can perform in the field uh, robustly. And that has led us to uh, potentially develop a, a machine that could commercially be adopted in, in recent futures so that farmers can now use these machines to meet the gap of not having enough people in the field, but also to improve worker health and safety. So these are some of the really important um, models and technologies and robotic solutions that we're developing based on the innovations that we have seen in, in, in AI and parallel computing areas, uh, again, that we discussed earlier. I'll just stop there, but Yeah, thank you for that. You're also um, bringing up a point how innovation will cause disruption, right? So Sharika, can you talk a little bit about automation and what um, you see as its impact on jobs in the labor market and what the government role can be to help some of that? Thank you. I uh, definitely want to lift up a few things. You know, when we're talking about AI and technology is absolutely a labor issue, a quality of life issue, and equity and civil rights issue. Um, advances in technology are constantly redefining the work landscape and creating new categories of jobs where none existed before and are making current jobs safer and better. Uh, but technological advances can also erase once vital and vibrant industries, and this is nothing new. Unions have been addressing and adapting to changes in the workplace, including job displacement caused by automation and digitization for more than a century. But all too often, technological advances are used as a cover by the rich and powerful to concentrate their wealth and turn good family supporting jobs into insecure, low wage or precarious jobs. And so the current pace of the technological breakthrough is happening very fast, right? Uh, no historical precedents. And it was mentioned, you know, calling this earlier that this is like a fourth industrial revolution. Um, automation, um, 
artificial intelligence is changing life and work and how people connect and communicate. Um, but it's raising questions on the future of work about jobs, profits, training and reskilling, innovation policy, algorithm bias and data privacy, democracy and power. Um, and so as we think about AI's impact on education, jobs and labor, this is an opportunity to reframe the question and consider how AI can help to ease, strengthen and support workers in these industries. I'm a pharmacy technician by trade. And so in my work, I have experienced um, the additions of word box into the workplace to count pills, um, as opposed to the addition of robots to help provide us with the opportunity for more face-to-face -face interaction with the workers we support. Uh, when they're sick. I know everyone in this room has experience, you know, calling uh, some company, you know, for customer support and going like, representative, please, because, you know, you want to talk to a real person. And so, uh, you know, what that looks like when you're sick and you just want to reach a person. And this isn't limited to just healthcare. Um, you know, when we're thinking about the building construction trades, much of the work that the people are for performing in this work is manually repetitive and physically strenuous. You know, at one point, the building trades um, unions in their contracts prohibited the use of power tools. So as we're looking at automation and what was frowned upon then, um, but look at where we are today and how these tools have helped to lessen the burden of the work, offering some relief on this backbreaking work and helping to make it um, the work safer. And so by making sure that labor and working people are at the table, um, you know, we can make sure that it's gonna work for working people. Because the use of artificial intelligence is one of the biggest issues in the nationwide strikes that are happening right now with SAG-AFTRA and the Writers Guild of America. Television and film companies are using AI to take away performers' jobs, and even their identities have been reported that the producers want to hire performers for one day of work, scan them, and then reuse their image for as long as they want. This isn't how AI should be used, and it should be used to make our lives better, not increase corporate profits at the margins and expense of American families and livelihoods, right? I mean, so the most straightforward concern um, when we're facing AI is that of autom automation, right? Um, and so this is a quality of life issue. There are tools that AI use to monitor, micromanage, and track workers. Um, and so are the benefits of these perpetual surveillance and automatic performance measures worth the stress, anxiety, and health risks that they create? This is not just a question for employers to answer. It's a question that all of us have a stake in answering. And you know, unfortunately, not all workers have the power of unions to, uh, to demand better. And so as we think about equity and civil rights, last month, the Biden-Harris administration announced voluntary commitments toward safety transparency and equity from some of the world's largest technology, technology companies as they develop and unveil AI. Um, and so for organized labor, this is a great start, but that's just that, a first step. Um, there is plenty of evidence that AI has the potential to profoundly harm workers in a lot of ways, from perpetuating racial and gender bias to amplifying disinformation. If left unregulated, AI and automated monitoring systems have a proven capacity to undermine American rights and destabilize career pathways. And so while we know that AI isn't designed to be racist, but it picks that up from us. Well-intentioned algorithms can lead to discrimination in hiring and workplace management. And in fact, it can make the discrimination automatic. And so we have to establish protections for um, protecting our workplace and civil rights. And so just as there have been opportunities for lessons learned when it comes to retraining, um, when we're thinking about just transition and climate, um, we can also use the same approach as we think about AI. And so in closing, I just want to say that, you know, AI and the use of it is a labor issue, um, quality of life, and as we're thinking about equity and civil rights, um, workers have to be a part of the conversation and finding solutions um, because for many workers, we don't yet understand the coming impacts of AI on our work, and we are raising our collective voices and union to uh, make sure that the gar we have guardrails to protect our jobs and families. Um, and so finally, in government, business, and our labor partnerships, we can use a workers' rights framework for the use of artificial intelligence in the workplace, procurement policy, civil rights and racial justice protections. You know, we can use technology for good and not greed to bridge the uh, inequality and create opportunities in a future for work that works for all of us. Thank you.
Ashley, did you have a comment to add to that? Uh, no. No. Okay. You were, <laughs> we were just making eyes at each other over across the table. Um, well, you mentioned. I think, I think you know one of the things. This isn't. We didn't just think about this today, right? And I so appreciate. Uh, Shakira being here and what the Labor Council is doing to raise this issue. And I think for us, um, she said it best, where a state with strong uh, workers in the productivity, one of the most unionized states in the country, and one of the most technology sophisticated states in the country. So let's figure out how to marry that up in the, in the right ways. But when we created the 2020 uh, 20 bill, the point was for the task force to consider this. I mean, we thought it was one of the biggest things. I would have said the information age in general was going to create a faster uh, turnover in productivity and change, and it, and it has, and there's many sectors that we have seen great transformation in. So the question is, how do we plan for transformation? And my guess is, just as you were saying, there, were, there was a moment when people didn't want to use power tools, and now we're really glad we had power tools. The question is, what are the things that we need to do federally? What did the task force look at that we needed to do to work collectively on understanding what this transformation might do and how to better plan for the future? Now, I, I'm, in my remarks, said transformation is going to happen. The question is whether we're going to prepare for it or not, and what kind of tools do we need to put in place to make sure that transformation is addressing the labor side of the equation. And so I don't know what you guys came up with so far. I definitely think that commerce, and so Dr. Lacazio as a representative of commerce, um, and Gina Raimondo as our commerce secretary did a really great thing when she was uh, the governor of Rhode Island, which was to take the most pressing workforce issues and match that up with a training and skilling program that got people more aligned. And so what, what I want right now is I want at least a million people retrained and skilled, particularly in apprentice programs, because that way you get to earn and learn. And I think the worker should be empowered with AI tools now, <clears throat> part of that apprenticeship, so their job is more effective and productive. So I do think we're going to have to figure out how to basically invest more in job training. We just have to do that. So I don't know what you guys, the two panelists who were part of that, or Dr. Lacazio, what do you think about this issue? I, I could just add a, a quick thought that, you know, it's so important that we keep labor at the table during all of this. Um, I'm thrilled we have labor at the table today, and we've got a strong voice in labor um, on the National Labor Advisory Committee. Um, and that's been really essential in bringing things like, you know, algorithmic management uh, issues to the table. Now, I'm not an expert on these. I'm not going to attempt to speak to these today, but just wanted to reinforce the fact that having labor at the table uh, is really important uh, in these conversations. Yeah. Um, the other thing I'll speak on personal capacity, not just on NIAC, but, uh, but just on because uh, um, in NIAC front, there is an explicit working group that thinks about AI and workforce, uh, bringing in multi-party stakeholders on this front, and we have recommendations uh, on this front, especially in year one, but year two, we are thinking a lot more on it. But one of the key ingredients I'll speak for personal uh, capacity is um, we had to prepare for this transformation, as you rightly said, Senator Rand, uh, because that will come whether we are ready or not, we might as well embrace on those front when it comes to education and skilling up, uh, and that is going to be such an important thing. Uh, just think about cloud computing alone when the entire IT industry has to change uh, what they had to do, let alone all the opportunities coming up. Uh, we had to actually, uh, like just in Amazon alone, we had to take a goal where we are skilling up like 29 million of people in the entire world to scale up cloud computing. With AI, that probably should be 10x more because of the potential of what it could be, let alone the other side on building these AI models in a responsible fashion so that it actually, we are ready in that front so, as well. But these are some of the things uh, we should be investing actively. So. And I just wanted to mention that NIST is working with the Department of Labor specifically around some of the issues they talked about. Um, bias associated with hiring, for instance. So, and I know you mentioned that 
that's something you really wanted to see is that partnering between commerce and labor around issues associated with fairness when using AI. One thing that's also emerged in the labor discussion is synthetic media. And Senator Cantwell, I know deep fakes in particular are something you've spoken about. Ryan, um, assuming you're still up there, um, I'll throw this question up to you. Can you talk a little bit about um, synthetic media or deep fakes? They have wide-ranging impacts, and I'd love to just know um, your thoughts on mitigation strategies. There are lo lots of different things floating around, but if you could just frame up the problem and some potential solutions. Sure. Um, one of the roles I have here at the um, University of Washington is that I co-founded the uh, Center for an Informed Public, which is devoted to studying and resisting misinformation and disinformation. And as part of that, um, we have been looking at deepfakes and in fact uh, helped the state of Washington pass pioneering deepfake laws uh, just recently. Um, so there's a few different strategies you hear about with deepfakes. Um, you know, detection is one of them, watermarking, um, and, and trying to establish provenance. And each of these strategies is very, um, uh, you know, ha has a lot of promise to it, but I have concerns about each one of them. Um, and so an issue with detection, trying to figure out what is real, what is a deep fake, um, is that, you know, technically deep fakes work in a way that's already adversarial, meaning there's two systems. One system shows you an, an image to a second system and essentially says, hey, does this look real to you? And it keeps showing iterations of that system until the system says, yeah, you got me fooled. And only then does it go out the door. And that's how it gets so realistic. Um, and so my worry with detection strategies, using AI in order to figure out what is real and what isn't, is that the moment there is an innovation around detection, it will get folded into that adversarial network and that in turn, um, the system will be able to use it in order to fool, um, in order to fool future systems. And so you have a bit of a cat and mouse game um, you know, where the, the mice are made out of cats. Um, watermarking is the idea that you'd be able to make sure that things are generated by, by synthetic media, um, have a little uh, mark that can't be removed that says, hey, this is not real. And I noticed that many of the big players have made voluntary commitments, including Microsoft, to ensure that the materials that are generated with their products um, are in fact watermarked. And watermarking is a great idea, but it also means that for the bad guys who don't obey it, you know, they, they can get around it, but also they get a credibility boost because you get acclimated to the idea that if you see something with a watermark, you know, it means that it's real or not real. And if they can spoof that, that's a problem. Um, you know, one of the most promising is the idea of trying to figure out where something's from, the sort of provenance of it, and making sure that you have a chain that connects you to the origin of something that you're seeing uh, and, and what you're seeing. Um, and you know, that's, that's very promising. So for example, you can use cryptography, and there's a process called C2PA that's being explored for this. Um, and that's very promising, but at the same time, I'm a little concerned about how computationally intense it is. So, um, you know, our planet is already beleaguered uh, without the massive amount of energy and materials that are that are being used in AI cryptography today. And indeed, the NIST framework risks harm to the environment as an AI risk to be considered. Um, so, you know, ultimately, I think it, it takes all these kinds of strategies, as well as a labeling of synthetic media requirement like we have in Washington, um, and a, a, a real willingness to enforce it when we see violations. Right? And when you do catch people making spoofs of something, say, around an election, um, really going after them. Um, so it's a, it's a complicated uh, question, but there are ways we can address it. Thanks, Ryan. We are going to um, turn over to questions from the audience. Uh, just a reminder to the press that you will have some time after the panel is over. So this is um, for audience Q&A. And while we're teeing that up, Ashley, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the innovation ecosystem. I know you work quite a bit with partners in academia and others to build a real system. So if you could just tee that up while we're getting settled in the audience. Sure. Um, you know, let me uh, maybe start by saying what I'm, what I'm very excited about in terms of the current moment. Um, you know, being in machine learning for a while, a lot of what we've done in the past is we've created specialized models, specialized technologies. You, know, you get your data set together and you, you, know, you work really hard and you, you get it to do one thing, like detecting objects and images or putting a label on them. Um, and now we're able to have these more uh, general purpose technologies, right, that people can pick up and use in many different ways, in many different contexts. 
Um, you know, the uptake of ChatGPT was just breathtaking. I was on a panel the other day where uh, a comedian just figured out that GPT-4 could make jokes that were actually funny, and this was just a revelation in, in real time. I spoke with a student that was using ChatGPT to uh, help write a grazing plan for cattle. You know, you have to write a plan to show that it won't, you know, erode the soil, for example. So the, the generality of the tools are, to me, what's, what's hugely exciting. But then what happens is we have these new risks and new trade-offs, right? We've got new trade-offs where uh, the, the, same, you know, uh, the same attribute where you can kind of pick it up and use it in any different way proposes new security risks, new, new things we need to think about. Um, I expect that if, you know, my child is using, uh, you know, a language model that there wouldn't be anything explicit in the conversation. On the other hand, if a script writer is using the language model, maybe that's something that's uh, important to the task. And so, you know, I think we have to come together now in this moment across sectors, government, industry, academia, and we have to understand how we want these systems to perform in these different contexts. Yeah. Um, and so as we consider trade-offs, if we have to consider them together with the benefits, and the opportunity costs now on the benefits are much higher uh, than they used to be now that we have these uh, general purpose technologies. And so I think that when we think about this innovation ecosystem, we're going to see a co-innovation Right, both on the side of using the technologies in exciting different ways, but you're going to see an equal amount of innovation on how we make them safe. Yeah. Um, and as we, you know, that's something I'm observing in Microsoft. That's something that I'm observing in the greater ecosystem. You know, I mentioned this uh, AFMAR program that we have, accelerating foundation models research. Actually, a university partner is looking at just this: how you take a foundation model and make the uh, they call it uh, contextual refusal, how the foundation model can refuse to engage depending on the context of use. Yeah. Um, and so actually, uh, University of Washington is another performer on that program, and they're looking at how you uh, can make a foundation model better at associating uh, the role of proteins in, in rare diseases. And so just that, that, that breath, I think, is, is hugely important. Um, and again, I think that innovation ecosystem is going to be important, uh, both on the, you know, the beneficial application side and you know, the side of keeping it safe, and we're gonna see you know, kind of co-innovation in, in both of those ways. Thank you. All right, we'll go to our first audience question. Anyone have any? I mean, I could keep going. <laughs> oh, great, okay. So my question is about regulation you want me to stand up? My question is about regulation and speed. Um, when Section 230 was written many, many, many moons ago, it made sense. And I think at this point there is broad agreement, including from former Congressman Rick White, that it needs to be updated, and yet we can't get Congress, I think even a fun more functional Congress, to, to change. The pace of innovation the pace of learning on the part of members of Congress and their staff, how do we marry being able to put in the needed regulation with how fast this um, technology is going to continue to change? And can you just share your name and affiliation so we know too? <laughs> Sorry, my name is Laura Ruderman. Um, right now I run the Technology Alliance. Thank you. Well, Laura, the Congress is literally full of ideas now about what to do about AI, and there will be a structured discussion when we return, um, led by Senator Schumer and others, for bipartisan legislation. So I do think there's going to be, I think Senator Thune has a bill out already that has some um, ideas on what he would like to see. So. Um, yes, technology is changing, and it's changing rapidly, but that's why I think we have to have the, the broader discussions about what are the priorities. I do think the 2020 bill gave the government a framework. Mm -hmm. I think it set the right discussions. Now the question is, as AI is literally rolling out in applications, what are some of those things? I think really the most important thing is to get a strong privacy bill. I think it helps us in the anti-discrimination things that were mentioned earlier by saying you can't use uh, an algorithm to discriminate against somebody for financial purposes or racial purposes and sets a framework in law. Those are laws that already exist today. 
but don't exist in, in the context of the information age where it might not be clear that that kind of discrimination is taking place. So I think that let's tackle the things that, that uh, help us today protect consumers. That's the most important thing and get a framework on how the United States continues to lead in this particular area. So one thing, you're right, is that not everybody is as informed, but most importantly right now, I believe that agencies on the research side have to stay as advanced as possible. They have to know and understand what's happening in the private sector and, and have a keen understanding of how the United States maintains a leadership role, both for national security and for competitiveness. And then out of that, I think these other policy directions uh, our colleagues can come to terms on as agencies like NIST and Commerce and Department of Justice and the White House and the President's science advisor says, yes, these are some of the recommendations that we should follow. That way the United States maintains a, um, a leadership role. And I'll just add to that, that we've been really working since the 2020 bill on understanding ways that we can accelerate our process in order to come to, um, uh, let's say, faster resolution of some of the issues that come to the table. And I, I'll say that we have always had a very complete thorough process where we do engage stakeholders all along the way. We're just looking for ways to accelerate that to get to answers quicker for the, for the benefit of, of the in, United States. Over here. Hi, uh, my name is Jackie Kane, and I'm here for, as a representative from the American Federation of Teachers. Um, across our state, I'm hearing a lot of faculty union leaders uh, very concerned about implementation of AI across our college campuses. There's been a lot of talk about academic honesty and chat GPT, but beyond that, there's also a lot of concern about privacy of student information, ADA accessibility compliance, and DEI issues. And it feels like there's no consistency from classroom to classroom or campus to campus in our state. Can anybody speak to um, any kind of messaging that might be going out from the state legislature or the State Board of Community and Technical Colleges to offer guidance? I, I don't know anything that the state is doing uh, on this, but you're right. They should come up with something and, and work collaboratively with teachers. We've definitely talked to several, and we've had a lot of input from them about what they would like to see, but you're right. At this level, it should be the state responding. Yeah, I would just add, I think it's a, a great opportunity to make sure that we are... Uh, that teachers and you know we professors and the unions we have an opportunity to uh, engage with elected leaders on these issues as we center a uh, worker voice and what it means for our work and the impact of our work and so i think it lifts up the question of or it lifts up you know why we need this partnership you know public private business labor um, why we all need to work on this together and then i would just add you know in terms of thinking about training for folks um, who are in school but also you know, people on the job, how are we, you know, rethinking about training and recentering um, and le doing this work from a worker centered framework? Um, when we're thinking about AI and not just getting rid of jobs, but how can we make them easier, you know, better? Um, it's really an opportunity to reimagine work. And I'll just add, you know, with the use of technology, maybe it's an opportunity to rethink an 80 hour or a 40 hour work week, an eight hour day, right? Um, you know, how can we reimagine work? Do we have another question? Thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Carrie Schroyer, and I'm the dean at Edmonds College, the STEM dean. My question is, well, actually I have a couple. Um, Edmonds College is creating an AI data science a center of excellence to help increase AI and data science literacy and provide affordable, accessible programming uh, to all members of the community. So funding is a critical component for our development, and we're wondering what type of funding there is specifically for community colleges to help us address these issues. Community colleges are community resources, and we really want to make sure that AI and data science is accessible to everyone. Okay. So I don't know if the panel, uh, the NIAC, discussed this, but this is one of the things we think government really could do in helping on the openness that Ali talked about, is that 
in an open architecture environment, we want to make sure that we are empowering all institutions and small businesses to take advantage of this. So since you mentioned Edmonds and you mentioned uh, one of the things that, that we're excited about and to um, Sharika's point is we know that we wanna keep our competitiveness in aerospace composites. We know that we think we need to get next generation composite science right and this would be a perfect example of where grants to community colleges could work with industry to make sure that we were training and skilling people in the right ways for that kind of uh, AI application. So we, you know, we want to make sure that it's being pushed out to all levels. That's really what we think an open architecture would, would help us do but there'll be applications that I think we have to target. What are the ones that really could be very powerful in helping America keep its manufacturing competitiveness? Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for two more questions. Hello, Ophir Onen, CEO of CalmWave. We appreciate all of the work that you are doing to support AI initiatives in Washington State and beyond. Our transparent AI platform is designed to remediate alarm fatigue in ICUs and objectively improve nurse retention, one of the biggest challenges in healthcare today. I'm interested in learning what you're doing to help AI startups innovate in the healthcare space, specifically with respect to improving access to usable healthcare data while taking into account the critical issues of patient privacy. Access to this data can be a daunting task for under-resourced startups entering the industry. Thank you. Anybody want to take that? Well, let me just say, I think that this is one of the reasons why that, you know, we have to have the public-private partnership because we want to have a discussion about what we think some of the best opportunities are. Um, when Nicole was talking earlier about what gets you, you know, excited about this, um, immediately I was thinking about weather AI because there's so much that's impacting and costing us today on uh, whether that if we were just a little bit more informed, a little bit more prepared, not that Mother Nature isn't going to have her way, but that we would be better at our response. And I think the same is with healthcare. So I would have no doubt that if we were really prioritizing collaboration, we probably pick some ways in which the healthcare system could help us skill and retain a workforce that would make their lives better. Now, your technology is helping. Um, nurses better understand the data that they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, helping them understand how to respond to that. So my sense is your application has already got all that it needs because it's in the marketplace. But there may be other applications that you're saying we have to do something additionally to help. And that's why the public-private partnership identifying those, those best opportunities could help us in you know moving forward as a nation. So. Ali again was saying, oh, here's our great opportunity. Let's unleash as much of this innovation as we can, but we're gonna have to understand what those uh, big, big opportunities. WSU seems to really be leading in the agriculture side, and I think we have three or four um, ideas presented in some of the panelists around here about agricultural uh, investments that are paying dividends. And that's really important because as big as tech is in our state, we're still a very big agriculture state. And the challenges are gonna get much worse given the changes. So WSU leading that. So I don't, I don't know who here should lead the healthcare, the healthcare kind of decision making, but clearly WSU being empowered has, has uh, taken AI and then decided two or three things that it's wanted to do with it. And I would think healthcare would need a similar partner. Can I take 30 seconds? <clears throat> just to <clears throat> aid on the discussions around data, because as we all know, <clears throat> AI models are mostly black, black box models, and data drives the overall generality, robustness, and other aspects <clears throat> around these models. So in agriculture, we have been creating consortiums where all these startup companies are willing to share data for collective good, um, including certainly research programs like mine around the world, actually, not just here in the US. We are interested in sharing all the data we have under whatever legal framework it is allowed 
so that everybody could benefit from the shared data uh, resources uh, in addition to open models we have from the, again, um, the discussions we heard earlier. Thank you. Yeah, I would just uh, mention I'm happy to connect uh, anyone in the audience uh, in terms of like thinking about healthcare. We have a coalition of healthcare unions who will absolutely want to be partners in a conversation, you know, um, including the Washington State Nurses Association, Service International Employees Union, and OPIU Local 8. And then um, also to the question around like the community and technical colleges, I just wanted to circle back that Chelsea Mason Placker is the uh, Workforce Development Director at the Washington State Labor Council, and she was re recently elected chair of the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. And so, um, you know, labor has a seat uh, at the table, and, you know, we are interested in continuing opportunities to make sure we are lifting up workers. Um, and, you know, as we're shape helping to shape the workforce um, and the employees within the system, and so partnering with um, AFT here in Washington as we continue those conversations. So basically everyone needs to talk to Sharika today. <laughs> we have one more question before we go to closing remarks. Hi, uh, Michelle Hart with Glowforge. Can you share any insight on initiatives, either legislative or private, that are aimed at ensuring equitable representation of women and other marginalized groups in AI-related spaces? Well, one of the things that um, I think that has been discussed is how to you make sure that as AI is rolled out, that it is rolled out to small businesses. And one of the, the ideas is how do you make that technology, again, back to Ali's point about openness, and then making sure that there are ways in which people can access that. Now, your company doing great work there using laser printing and AI to expand your footprint in business. You would want people to have the, uh, you know, work with the small business uh, loan programs and others. But I, my guess is at this point, um, because we've worked a lot at small business, that women and their loan sizes and focus, you know, we really had to change the SBA program to make it more accommodating. And, and here, I think what we need to do is make sure when we put out resources for small businesses related to AI, that's when we make sure there's diversity. All right, we're gonna move to um, some closing remarks. Dr. Lukoski, do you wanna begin? And Senator Campbell, do you wanna close us out? I'll be very brief and just uh, thank you all for the opportunity to be here with you today and to, and to learn about what's going on in the state of Washington. Um, you know, your questions, the questions that you directed toward us are also very informing for me um, to inform our future path and the things that we need to do at NIST to really serve you better. So I'll turn it over, I think, to Senator Cantwell. For well, questions. thank you, Dr. Lacazio. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for the NIST help at the University of Washington, and we greatly appreciate that. Very proud of our region's leadership in AI and very proud that we're all here to discuss its future. The applications that we see today show the great promise of this technology, and yet we also know we need to continue the collaboration to make sure that the implementation phase and the challenges that we have to face as a nation are addressed. But the good news about us in the Northwest is we are very collaborative, and that's something we know how to do well. So. Hopefully this will be the beginning of a conversation about more implementation. Maybe we'll be back next year with even bigger uh, panel and bigger uh, uh, applications to see for the future. But thank you all very, very much to everybody. And thank you, Nicole, for being our moderator for this discussion. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.